This conference will now be recorded. Good evening. Thank you for attending the Patrick Medford Library's presentation, Ask the Experts, Dinosaurs. We are here tonight with Dr. Maureen Bickley from the Museum of the Earth in Upstate Ithaca. And she is a museum educator and prep lab supervisor. And I'm going to turn the time over to her. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks um, to all who are attending. I wanted to um, say hello and um, all the way from um, central New York in the Finger Lakes. I don't know if anybody's been to the museum, so I wanted to first start off with kind of a quick kind of overview of, of our institution. So in Ithaca is home to Cornell University. And in fact, it was where our director first started back in 1932. He um, Created, he left Cornell and started his own fossil collection and um, called it the Paleontological Research Institution. And Gilbert Harris was the director and he um, created the, the collection and um, watched over it for years and eventually has come to the point where we are now not only just a collection of, of research fossils, which is our collection is probably one of the 10 best in the world um, with over 7 million specimens. Um, I don't think we can tell you per count that how many there are, but that's a guesstimate. And um, we have um, not only the collection and our, our paleontologists who are, are doing research on them, we also uh, opened a museum, which is where I am right now, in 2003. So Museum of the Earth was created and built in 2003, and it is on one of, on the west side of Cuga Lake. So it is um, a natural history museum. It's not a really huge one. It has six, seven um, galleries to learn a little bit about how the earth um, evolved and changed over time from the time it was first formed to present time. We have a huge Mastodon skeleton that was found in Hyde Park, New York, which is a little bit closer to you. And um, we have a North Atlantic right um, whale skeleton in, in our entrance. So we do have some large specimens. We even recently in the last several years was able to have some um, items transferred from the, the car, or from the Smithsonian. Um, when they closed down their halls and they fixed their halls up, they decided they weren't going to put some of their artwork back in there. And so we have a life-size stegosaurus. We have the Quetzalcoatlus, that um, giant pterosaur that um, flew over their dinosaur fossils. There is now in our museum. So we have some really interesting things in our museum um, that hopefully maybe when we people can start moving around, you can come see it. But we're going to center on the prep lab, which is my favorite place to be. I am the educator here. I um, educate in many, many different levels. So I, one of my main um, jobs as an educator is to educate first graders who come and we learn about um, the geology of New York. So we, we learn a little bit about that in this area. And then we, um, but I also, you know, give tours. I teach a one credit course through Cornell on fossil preparation. So there's many things that I do along with that, but I, this is my favorite place to be. So this is the first time we have done any kind of presentation through um, in, in the lab. So what do we do in our lab is not as much research as some lab, as some prep labs. So we have research labs there in another another building. Um, all of our all of our fossil all of our paleontologists are invertebrate paleontologists. What does that mean? They don't work on dinosaurs. So um, when you want to work on dinosaurs, you you have to come to my lab because we have them in our, in our lab. But our lab is pretty much since it's in the museum, it, it's really kind of based on, on exhibits. So people um, come and work in our lab, and a lot of it is interacting with the visitors and answering questions and what we're doing. Um, and so for this presentation, I hope to show you the lab, show you some of the um, specimens we have, why do we have them, maybe talk a little about techniques. Uh, 
But before I do that, I want to kind of talk a little bit about what is a paleontologist and what's a fossil preparator, because you're going to hear me say them separately. You can be both. It's perfectly fine. But a fossil preparator doesn't have to be a paleontologist. And that leads it to me. I am not a paleontologist. I am a, actually a veterinarian who retired years ago and have been working in a, in a fossil prep lab and a natural history museum for almost 20 years now. So I have switched over to dead animals and work on them instead of instead of trying to keep my dogs alive. So um, the fossil prep or to be a preparator, your job is not necessarily to be concerned with identifying what it is you're what you're doing. You are preparing that fossil so people can do better research on it, or to maybe be able to see it better, or um, just to make it look better. And um, we do, we get trained through technology. So when I look at a, if I look a rock, I'll show you, if I look at a rock, I don't necessarily say what fossils are in there. I think about this is shale, shale breaks easily. How do I deal with getting the fossils or getting to the fossils? So it's, it's the process more than just, you know, I don't want to wreck my fossil, um, but I want to have it available for whoever wants to study it or look at it. A paleontologist studies fossils, so they they go and they usually have a master's or a PhD, and they um, have studied a specific um, evolution and geology and um, the the life of long ago along with their specific fossils. So our paleontologists at P, at PRI right now are all invertebrate fossils, and at the moment, I think everybody studies snails. So so. Snails have been around for a long time, so we have many different kinds of snails that they're studying. But it, you don't prep very much on snails. <laughs> so, so what I have to do in the lab is find specimens for people to work on and then train them to work on those labs, those um, fossils. And since this is, the subject is about dinosaurs, um, I wanted to first talk about the main fossils that we have in our in our museum at this moment. So one of the things is, since I don't have a researcher in my institution who needs things that need to be prepped, I have to get um, specimens on loan. And one of the ways we have been going doing this for many years is through the Carnegie Natural History Museum. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of history about the Carnegie. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever, if everybody's ever visited the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. It's, it is a fantastic natural history museum, but art museum and, and um, other kinds of science science museums. So it's it's a it's a wonderful um, air place to go and see um, beautiful specimens and items. So, um, but what's happened is that they have um, they've collected fossils for a long, long time. Um, dinosaur fossils, and many of their dinosaur paleontologists have now moved on, and that's not their focus in their museum, and so they only have a few, and they have lots, literally tons of fossils um, sitting in their collections, and they need somebody to take care of them, and so we um, get them on loan for about two years, and if we are not done with taking care of them, we um, we go we can go another at least couple two years, and they would give us as much time as we need to um, take care of them. So behind me is a is a container. I'm going to show you the fossils, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the Carnegie. And we're going to go kind of go deeper into the actual fossils because I have a little PowerPoint to talk about the Carnegie Museum and the history of where it is that they collected this, which is um, now Dinosaur National Monument. So let me um, move the camera a little bit, and we're going to look at some of the fossils that we have. So here is a giant shoulder blade of a dinosaur. It's called an apatosaurus. It, um, most likely, it's a apatosaurus. It's one of those things where we don't have it all completely open and uncovered. I'm going to show you a picture of it next to an apatosaurus shoulder blade, and you can decide if you think it looks like it. And then the other one we have is this big long bone, and that is a, probably a Camarasaurus tibia, and I actually have a picture of it. Um, we use it in our in our museum to show people what we're using, and I think 
right now it came in many pieces. So here's a Camarasaurus, and here is where the tibia is on, on this on this animal. Um, so the shoulder blade came all together in a six foot, seven foot long um, 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 box crate. Thank you. Old wooden crate. And the bone, the long bone, the tibia came in pieces in that thing. So it was all wrapped up. So um, let's go to the PowerPoint. I don't have any questions yet, right? Okay. Um, we're going to go to the PowerPoint. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, the Carnegie story. Okay. Okay. So the Carnegie Quarry was founded um, through by the Carnegie Museum. They um, gave um, supported Earl Douglas. Earl Douglas went out west. He was the picture of Earl uncovering the first eight tail bones of the dinosaur in Dinosaur National Monument. Um, I'm always amazed at what kind of equipment they must have had to get through some of these this rock because we have a hard time sometimes getting through this rock. Um, and so in 1909 they um, put, they started collecting bones and sending them back to Pittsburgh. And um, for what was about 15 years, um, Douglas, um, Earl Douglas sent about 350 tons of rock back to their collections. And I guess after that, they decided that they didn't really need any more rocks. And so that was when it was given to the country and it became the Dinosaur National Monument in um, 1915. So here's a picture of Earl, and here is um, him standing next to, I think this is um, one of his first dinosaurs he uncovered. This is also one of those long sauropods, and this is a Diplodocus. Um, I just like, you know, these guys must have just gone out west and found these things and was just loved being able to stand in front of a camera next to these gigantic bones. So what he's standing in front of looks like a, a femur, which would have been um, the top part of a leg. So you can imagine that compared to his top of his leg. The other inset picture in there is the crate that our fossils came in on um, a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago. And um, you can see it's very old because it was collected back in, I think it was 19, um, it was closer to the 19, 1909, um, and put in that box and sent to the Carnegie Museum, Pittsburgh, PA, Shady Side Station, um, and it got there. So, and until it got to us, no one had opened it up. So no one had seen what the inside of it. Earl had meticulous notes and had lots of notes, but this fossil actually was in a place where I don't know if it was the time when he was digging it up and not, um, and, and it was just, there was probably so much he was getting that there wasn't a lot of information about what was in that particular um, crate. And it turns out that it was the shoulder blade, which he mistaken said that it was a, a meat-eating dinosaur, which are called theropods would have been a huge one. And that's one of the reasons why the Carnegie wanted us to open it up and look at it, because they were excited that it might be a, a new dinosaur. Turns out that it's not. But, um, and um, and then there were these four or five other smaller um, packaged up bones, which are called jackets. They're plaster um, covered. And they were stuck into that crate as well. And we had no information about what that was. And when we opened it up, there were many, many tiny little pieces along with some big chunks. So just to give you some ideas, a lot of people talk about um, places that dinosaurs lived. Um, you can go online and you can get pictures that, of artists of what they think um, these places look like. Uh, and this big picture of the map is you see the states kind of written or, or um, drawn out in that area, but now that area is all mountain. And you can see back about 150 years ago when these dinosaurs were alive, there wasn't any mountain. So the mountains are getting going to start uplifting in about, um, 
at the end of the Jurassic period, we start uplifting. Um, and you see there's a series of um, rivers, and then there's this lake there called Di at, at the Dinosaur National Monument. And we think that that was a, like a hold of when animals died, that they would get carried into that area and just dumped into this lowland area for years tens of millions of years and so there's just stacks and stacks of these dinosaurs and the picture there um, next to it with all the dinosaurs these are the um, a lot of the dinosaurs that were found in there they also found many plants and um, other animals that lived within this whole ecosystem um, and so lots of interesting things the ones that we have are the camarasaurus and the apatosaurus um, those are the two fossils so even though they were in the same crate, they are two different dinosaurs. And um, I'm not sure if the next picture is um, of, so this is our Patasaurus. This is um, the shoulder blade um, picture of the one that's sitting in our museum. And that is comparing it to the shoulder blade on this dinosaur, which is the um, Patasaurus first dinosaur found, um, a first Patasaurus and one of the first um, sauropods found the Carnegie found it. This is the Patasaurus. This is the story that everybody knows or has heard of. The Brontosaurus doesn't exist anymore. Um, now there's a question that maybe there wasn't a Bron there was a Brontosaurus, but the Patasaurus. This Patasaurus was the first one found, um, and it was one of the few that had a skull, so we could identify the whole thing. The skull is not the one that's up there now because it's too it's too fragile and um, heavy so they don't put it up there but um, when the brontosaurus skeleton was found they call the brontosaurus because it's huge as you can see by the people um, they, they put the um, they call it brontosaurus which is thunder lizard which is the most awesome <laughs> of, of names and um, but they later found out that the brontosaurus skeleton was an apatosaurus skeleton and so um, they, they just thought it was a younger um, apatosaurus skeleton, wasn't as big. Uh, so it is probably that the brontosaurus doesn't exist um, and we wait for more testing to decide. But I wanted to show this picture because this is the exhibit at the Carnegie. You would see that if you go to the Carnegie in their big hall, their big dino hall. But the you can see kind of the shape of the, the shoulder blade that we have sitting on our table is similar to what we're seeing. and. Um, Hopefully, um, we have the whole thing. So this is a picture of an apatosaurus with all of her skin and muscles on. So this is what she would have looked like, um, not with just her skeleton. And I just, you know, you've probably seen it. These are pretty amazing animals, you know, 30 tons, um, 60, 70 feet long, big, long, whippy tail, and um, tiny little head. So it was... Um, strange strange animal walking around um, amongst the the ground out there that we now know as you know Wyoming and, and Utah so the Camarasaurus is um, also a sauropod but um, it is more closely related to the Brachiosaurus and um, it is one of the smaller ones but it's a very common um, fossil um, or skeleton found at the Dinosaur National Monument. And you see the picture of the baby Camarasaurus and the adult Camarasaurus because they found many different age um, Camarasauruses. And I know that they have like a complete skeleton of, of a juvenile um, Camarasaurus all, put, all together, which is pretty, pretty amazing because in this, in this um, place, in this um, area, um, most of the time, because it was this floodplain where these, the bodies of these animals would all kind of congregate, often the bodies would break apart and, and we don't get them all together. Here's just a picture of um, the quarry. This is a head, um, an actual head of the uh, Camarasaurus. It's pretty amazing when you go see them because they are in situ, they're right there in the wall of the rock, which is now um, vertical, but it went when they died and were turning to stone, it was horizontal. So the uplift of the mountains pushed this, this up. But now it's almost like looking at pages of a book. And this is just a picture of 
all the kinds of bones that they're going to have to go through as they jumble through this um, quarry and try to figure out the, the bones. So, so this is what they look at when they go to this. So this is just bones of dinosaurs, many bones of dinosaurs. On the left are just the many different kinds of dinosaurs that are represented to the right. And there are just many, many different dinosaurs together that have just broken apart and um, we have pieces and parts. And I think the Diplodocus scapula, which is three, five, yep, is right there. Um, one of the things that I notice about the Diplodocus scapula is that it is um, at the, like that t bottom T part of it, it is, it's narrow and it's flat. So if you look at other skeletal, um, other scapulas or shoulder blades um, of these kinds of dinosaurs, um, it is, they're, they're different shapes. So that's one of the ways you can help identify it. Sometimes the skeletons are all together. So here, these are just actually, um, pictures of what the wall looks like, and the, the, the bones that are there. And I put this one in here because I think it's the 4516, which is the tibia that we are working on um, in our lab. So I just wanted to show you some of those things. So this is what they see. You can see that the head and the neck is right like within the body cavity, and the ribs are down below, and then the legs are down below, below those. So this animal stayed together, but did break apart in, the, in its time before it actually started turning into to rock. Okay, so we can go on to view. So we can see some of these up close and personal. So that's a Carnegie. And so we get a chance to work on these. And these fossils were um, brought into the, the lab this time with specific requirements of who was allowed to work on it, and there's special training to go into that. Um, the, the original preparator worked on the, the tibia, and it came in little pieces. I want to show you one of the jackets. So covered with, with, um, with a plaster, there is burlap in there, and then they usually use some type of separator, which is paper. So all of this stuff has to be brought to the quarry, and then those rocks have to be pulled out and covered and wrapped up and then put in into the crate to, to go on a train back to, to Pittsburgh. So just just some of those kinds of things. I think about like how these people, like they didn't have cars and they didn't have trucks very much. Um, you know, it was all pretty, pretty tough. It was pretty rough rough areas where they were going. Um, so that is, I just keep these just so people can see what what it is. And we just cut these out and we pull the fossils out as we as we go. Usually we don't pull them out of the, the, the um, jackets right away. So they provide a little support. So what I want to do is we'll first start with the, um, the shoulder blade. We're going to go back there and see if I can do this yeah there. so the shoulder blade is um is about six feet long and it's breaking up it's been in this um this this is the um jacket and this is rock and then while we were doing this it just has been breaking up as we do it it's been in this thing for over 100 years and no one's been touching it um, and so the bone, this is the bone, and you can see cracks in it, and we put some, some preservative on there to, to hold the cracks in there, and, or hold the pieces in there so we don't lose them. And as we take them out, we, we make sure that we keep them lined. And generally what we do is as we do this, because I think all these came out of this spot here, we take pictures and we, we document where they go so they can go back. And so we have just taken and opened this part up and we still have um, the rest of that to go on this shoulder blade. But you can see that the, it's pretty thin right here and it goes in here and, and then tees out that direction. The reason I have this in a um, in this plastic kind of um, booth is that it rains a lot of dust, and um, one of the things we worry about in the lab is um, dust 
that contains silica. So silica dust is not um, very safe to breathe in. And so everyone now is familiar with masks. Everybody knows about N95 masks, but working in a prep lab, you're very familiar with N95 masks because that is what they're for. They are to prevent you from breathing in um, tiny particles. And um, so now we're using it to not breathe out on people. But in the, in the lab here, we've been using masks for a long time. And generally we do that. Um, there's a, a suction to suck out the, the dust, but the person in there has goggles on and, and a mask to, to work while he's working in there. But it also keeps anybody else that has to be in here in the lab safe as well. Okay, now we're gonna come over here and see if we can get on this, because this is a pretty amazing specimen. I think it's about three or four feet long. This is one end, this is the lower end. This is the lower end. Um, dinosaur bones, um, the joints are not smooth like you would expect it to be. There is a lot of cartilage at the end of that, and that is just a place where there is cartilage. Here's, here's another um, piece of that. So I would think, you know, when you think about joints, you expect it to be very smooth and um, not, not the case for dinosaurs. So I have a lot of people ask me, like, how do you know that that is a bone and not just a rock? And I don't have any rocks. It was it was easier over on the other side to show you. But one of the is that I want to see if I can do this. You can see there's tiny little holes in here, and they're not the same. So these holes go these. There's some lines here, and then so this is probably marrow, and in a bone would be kind of. Um, almost like sponge, so they would call it spongy bone. And then this is starting to be where it would be bone that would be weight bearing. And so it needs to have these, these lines in here to support. So it would be weight bearing in that direction. Um, the outside, let's see if I can get this in focus. Okay, so this is the outside. This is more cortical bone. This would be a more, this is smoother. So yes, rocks can have bone, smooth sides and they can have holes in them, but this is very structured. If you, um, this looks like, this looks like a bone to me. It's not, it's a rock, but it looks like a bone. So what, um, what my preparator has to do is now, um, find all the pieces that go with this. And so he's been working on this one and putting this together and trying to match it. But we have, let's see, we just have boxes of these. I'm gonna tell you the story that we, we when we found this, uh, we have just boxes and boxes of small little pieces. And um, we keep them in bags so we don't lose them. They're, they're numbered and they're cataloged. But when he wants to work on them, he has to pull them out of bags and then lay them out and try to figure out how they all match together. And um, not easy on a three or four foot um, bone. It, it's, it's a puzzle. So very different techniques that are used for these, for these things. One is just pulling out this bone, the shoulder blade, you know, opening up the scapula and, and removing the rock that's around it to puzzling things together. It's not all using tools and, and things. Sometimes it's just um, physically puzzling and putting them together. So it takes some skill, some patience, some skill to understand what a bone looks like and how they would match and how they go up together. We have pictures of previously drawn um, tibias, so um, of tibias of dinosaurs of this kind that have been put together already. So we are of the advantage that other people know what a, a, a our Camarasaurus tibia looks like, but also tibias of any kind of skeleton kind of looks the same. So, um, so those are the two dinosaur fossils that I have in my in my lab. It provides about three of my preparators um, work whenever they come in. My preparators are all volunteers. They come in, they get trained, they get trained on their on their project. And they and they work from there. So I wanted to show you guys um, some tools that we use when we do that. So let's see. 
So we knew everything from very hand and soft um, tools like this. This is called a pin vise. We use dental picks because dental picks are very hard, um, sharp tools to, to um, remove the, the rock from, from our fossils. But then we go to bigger tools. So we get we have air scribes. This is um, one air scribe. Um, we often go with what the what the end is. So this is um, a flat tip. And um, what do I have? Let's see if you can see it. Flat tip on there. And so this would be a great tool to remove large quantities of, of rock, not one that you might want to use for getting your uh, fossil out, but just to remove it to get to the fossil. Um, we have smaller tipped um, air scribes, so when we get down to the, the fossil, we can, we can be more careful. These things are like jackhammers, so they go back and forth thousands of times a minute and um, will rotate and they blow a little bit of air so it keeps your, your area um, clean and, and open. But they can get big. So this is, a, that was a, a micro jack and this is a super jack. And um, so they can get really big. And we often use this one when we're using the dinosaurs because they're in sandstone and they're, they're pretty, pretty hard to, to get through sometimes. Just also wanted to show you one of the things that's a little bit different in fossils than, you know, you can glue your fossil back together with, um, with, um, you know, Elmer's glue with super glue. It, it, those work. Um, but when you're working on fossils that are of research quality, you want to be able to reverse that. And you want to put something on there that's not going to damage the fossil itself. And so we use um, something called Echoid B72, which is a, um, basically it's a plastic. Let's see so I can get that up there so we can see it. It's a, a plastic that will dissolve in acetone or alcohol and be liquid. And then we can apply it to the fossil, and then once that alcohol or acetone um, evaporates away, it will become hard again. And so it will become plastic again and non-reactive, but it will hold everything back together. So we use that. That has to be specially mixed up, but it is the glue or adhesive of choice in, in our lab. Does anybody have any questions? So far, there's nothing in the chat box, but if anybody wants to unmute themselves, feel free to do so or type it in the box. It's okay. Very interesting so, so far. Thank you. <laughs> so what I wanted to talk about here was now we looked at the tools and we looked at some of the, the, the big specimens which I'm not going to work on tonight. Um, I wanted to show you a specimen that um, that I worked on the last couple of weeks, and I videotaped. So you could see me actually doing the, the prepping the work. And um, this is, let's see if I can do this. No, I'm going to do it this way. OK, this is the fossil that I'm going to go after. And this is this is what it looks like now. This is just shale. This is a local fossil. You can see that shale is pretty much a simple. Let me put this down here. And see if we can do it from here. It's just a simple gray rock. It has layers, so shale is really hard to work with. I'd much rather do dinosaurs than than shale because it just breaks apart. And um, but it's soft, so you can use lots of tools, unlike most of the dinosaur fossils. So I thought I would show you, because most of the time I train a lot of my fossil preparators on shale. We have a lot of it, so if they break it apart, it's not a big deal. But it also is, um, it's, it's easy to work with in general. You just have to be aware that 
you can probably see there's lots of cracks here. And if you're going after one thing, you can crack it off and then you could lose your fossil. So you always have to think about your how you advance and stop and, and look. So I've got a couple minute video of me um, exposing this fossil. And I'm going to show it to you and then we I can talk through it. Go ahead. So here I am showing you just, here's a fossil. Um, I'm pointing to the fossil right there. That is what I want to go after. I'm looking at if there's anything important. I'm looking at the rock to see what kind of layers, what is it. It's just a really kind of, the picture isn't as obvious because you have, um, it, it looks all brown, but it's, they're different colors. So I'm using that micro pick. You can see the, 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 um, the point there that is going to that's vibrating, and um, you will see when I get in a good position um, that it will start taking off and chipping off the rock. Technique-wise, is I have to think about not hitting the fossil I want, and I want to, um, and you can see that I'm doing it at different, like almost a, a checkerboard, because that helps you to break off chunks as you do that. So it's just a technique to um, to cut through and take take things off. Um, probably took me about a half hour. We're going to do this in about three minutes. Um, and as you go, you're always assessing what is that fossil look like? Where is it? What else oh, comes off? And so sometimes, especially with shale, that will happen. And I have actually, through that, looked to make sure that my fossil is still there. And now I'm going again. Um, it's just time after time, and there's a fossil starting to, to appear there up in the top left. Um, and I've gotten to the point where I've removed most of the rock that's around it. And I'm seeing other fossils that are there. Now, um, as a preparator, depending on what you're going after, you could just expose all of these so you have this beautiful little bed of fossils. I'm just going to go with that one and show you that. But it also had stuff on it. So that's what I'm, I'm telling you. It's not cleared off. So you can go now and use a, a hand tool. So this is a dental pick, and I could go and carefully remove within all of those little cracks and crevices with a hand tool. But I chose to do an air abrasion so, to partially so you can see it. An air abrasion basically is like a little... Um, sandblaster, but we use a very fine dust to, to blast it at high power. And um, you're going to see that I start it up and it chops off like a chunk very quickly. And I realize that I'm doing it. So I'm going to try, basically, I just want to take that top little kind of crevices off. But what's happening is it's just too high power. So I'm slowing the, the power back. And now I'm just working on um, at different angles and in different directions to try to clean off the fossil itself. But of course, it leaves some white dust on it. So if I can use a hand brush if I need to, to brush it off, that might be all I need to clean it. Um, I also can use um, air tools to blow the rest of that away to make it look um, better. Um, I think I'm going to come in with that too. So so basically, part of it is, is just looking to see what is what is exposed? Do I want to expose anymore? Do I want to go after anything else um, and see what's there? It's at a point where now you can, oh, so I was able to just chop that extra layer off, um, which I had been working on, and expose the fossil right underneath there. It's another brachiopod right there. So now if I'm basically considering myself done, I'm going to just blow off at a high power um, with the with the um, air tool, and I just cleaned it off, and now I can see the um, fossil and the other fossils. But now I can see what how my work did. So that is um, that is the way that I often use those techniques to train my. Um, Preparators. So somebody comes to me and says, I'd really like to volunteer in your museum. Um, there's a, an orientation, and then I we go through the different techniques. And usually what we would do is I would hand them a, a rock like that, 
and we would start off with using hand tools. We'd try different kinds of hand tools. We'd see how effective we are, and we would move up up the 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 tool line to see what kind of work, what kind of damage, or what kind of um, how does it work on that rock. And the one thing I've learned with um, fossils or you know, with the fossils itself is that everyone's different. So I could pull off another Devonian shale rock and it's going to behave very differently um, and it's going to potentially be just a completely another different kind of um, tool that I might need to do. And it will also depend on what it is I'm going after. So my dinosaur bones, when the tibia came in, it came in many, many pieces. We are kind of not sure if they broke the, the rock up at the quarry so it would fit into the crate because they were these little chunks that were stuck in the corners. Like they said, hey, we've got some, some room. I don't want to build another crate. We're just going to break this rock up or this bone up and somebody at the museum will take care of it. So there are lots of little pieces. We don't know if that's the case. It might have been that it was just all broken up and they decided they're going to put it together and they're going to put it into the crate for someone to... to you know, filter through and decide what, what to use. Um, since it was a hundred years ago, there's nobody, nobody to ask how that all came, came about, but we didn't even know what the tibia, that there was a tibia there that, that had not even been described. So my uh, main preparator, he likes to work on the tools and he cleaned all of the, the surrounding rock and that's called matrix um, away from the bone. And then he said, this is it. I'm going to send this back to the museum, um, the Carnegie. And I said, no, no, we're going to put this back together. So I had to find someone who liked to do the puzzling. So I found a couple uh, preparators who wanted to do that. They're not really doing any, really any cleaning. They are just now trying to figure out what piece goes to, to that. And so there's lots and lots of work and there will be hours and hours and hours. And I hate that the museum has been closed for so long because no one's been in the lab to, to, to do that. And so we've lost a big chunk of our time um, to work on our, on our dinosaur bone. But over time, we'll be able to get that put together. And the idea is that it will go, the, the long bone will go together as a tibia. And um, the shoulder blade, I think, will stay together. It's all together. And the whole idea will be to try to make it um, to get it out of the rock and make it as stable as possible so it will be able to go back probably in a much more careful and um, padded environment than it did when it came from Utah. Okay. Okay. So um, I don't know if we have any more questions, if there's anything you want to see, if you have any questions about dinosaurs. I haven't talked a lot about dinosaurs. Um, I talked about some bones of the dinosaurs. Um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if they are on you. Let's see. So, um, one question was, what is your favorite dinosaur and why? So I get that asked a lot and it has been, so I have been doing fossil preparation for about tw almost 20 years now. Um, and the first dinosaur I worked on was kind of looking like this dinosaur's bones, this long bone, this tibia. It was in many, many pieces, but one chunk of it was the backbone. It was a vertebra of a diplodocus. And I, that was it. It was instant love. And I worked on that for, I don't know, four years, never got all the pieces back together. But um, from then on, I've just been enamored that there could be animals as big as these big long sauropods and the bone that I worked on was just one of the bones and it was, you know, a big, a big backbone. It wasn't even the biggest backbone. It was, I think it was, we think it might've been maybe um, one of the tailbones. So those are not the biggest, the biggest bones. So, um, you know, now that these tibias come in and these scapulas come in, I'm not as shocked at that, but it's been 20 years since I, since I had that initial amazement. So that is why, um, you know, I learned a lot about that dinosaur at the time, and um, I got to work on its bones. So that was pretty cool. It's my story. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? So 
the one question for everybody is, I don't know if you realize that New York, the whole state of, does not have any dinosaur fossils in it. And the only fossil we have is a trace fossil. So these are bone fossils or body fossils. And the other kinds of fossils is a trace fossil. And the trace fossil is um, something that was left by an animal but that animal's no longer there. So it might be a burrow, or it might be a footprint, it might be a, a, a nest of an egg nest, or something like that. And so New York only has what looks like dinosaur footprints um, down in the, it's I think in the Nyack area, so it's close to um, New York City. Only place that we have it, because most of our rock is much older than any dinosaur bone, that, so it couldn't be in there. Um, I do get a lot of people bringing these big rocks and saying, oh, here's a dinosaur egg. And it's not because it's from New York. We don't have dinosaur eggs um, in New York. We have concretions. Um, and so those are just the formation of a big round bone or rock that looks like an egg. So um, unfortunately, if anyone wants to actually study dinosaurs, you're going to have to either hole up in a um, museum and study them and we're going to go somewhere else to actually collect them. Um, most of the dinosaur, um, some of the best collection areas are in South America and out west and Canada and um, it's China. So China has some amazing um, dinosaur fossils too. So it's just, we just don't have it because our, our rocks are just too old. All the rest of the rock that was dinosaurs have been crushed up and dissolved from the glaciers that came after the dinosaurs came through. So, unfortunately, <laughs> we don't got them. Yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Have you ever gone on like a dinosaur dig? I have not gone on a dinosaur dig. I went to the Dinosaur National Monument. Um, visited there. I've been out um, on digs in different places where we could potentially have found dinosaurs, um, but they have not. They Most of the places I've been to didn't get a dinosaur. It usually was an invertebrate that we found. So I've been on, on ones, but I've not gone out with um, actual fossil preparators or fossil paleontologists who are looking for their particular dinosaurs. So um, someday, Someday I would like to do that. There are lots of fossils out there and um, hard to find them. And um, pretty much vertebrate fossils, so an animal that has a skeleton, you can't just dig up unless you have permits. So um, if you are going to go, you're going to either have to go out on private land or you're going to have to go out with a group of people who have the permit to go and collect those fossils. Good question. Has, has anybody been out fossil collecting at all? You know, dinosaur or not? Yes. Since I, so I just told you, you can't find dinosaurs in New York. <laughs> so Long Island is really an interesting geological place because you are all the crud that the the, the, the uh, glaciers push down, and potentially you might find a broken up dinosaur bone in there um, be probably pretty unlikely, but um, it's all the stuff that it pushed from northern areas down into your into your area. So um, not as probably as many fossils as just really interesting um, ocean animals. You can probably find some interesting like um, shark teeth and whale bones and things like that along the, along the coast. Whales almost as big as dinosaurs. <laughs> or are as big as dinosaurs. What am I saying? Yeah, they are. So, so uh, we speaking have... of size, what's the largest dinosaur bone you've ever seen or worked on? The largest largest one I've ever seen was a vertebra of um I went to I think it was a natural history museum. No, it was, in, it was in the Cleveland Naturalist Museum. They had a um, dinosaur, uh, like large, it was like extreme dinosaurs. And they had a vertebra of 
one of those big gigantic titanosaurs. Um, and then I also saw the titanosaur, which had a big. That was that was a not that one I think was three D printed, but um, it has some big femurs too. So titanosaurs are probably your biggest bone animals anywhere, and they are you know bigger than a person. Um, so those things are huge. Hard to believe they can move around. These are probably some of the biggest ones I've ever worked on. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? <laughs> How did you get involved in the field? Okay, I'll try to make this short. I'll try to make this short because my daughter is the one who's the tech person standing behind the camera and she's part of this. So. As I said at the beginning, I am a veterinarian who retired and tried to decide what to do and started a family. I had twin girls who, here we go, we spent many a day in the library. We went to story time weekly, and every story time, I had to bring home 20 books to read to them. And they would make me read them in the that afternoon, so then they would spend the rest of the week going through their their books but it turned out about when they were about two they were incredibly excited about dinosaurs and um, as a um, an older person I never actually got a class like our science class they pushed me through because I was smart enough to get into advanced classes and they said you don't need our science well I just really hated that I missed all that our science because once they started reading about dinosaurs, my daughters, I started saying, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, geological history and paleontology is just so awesome. And so while they were looking at kids' books, I would go over and read every book I could in the library about paleontology and dinosaurs and, um, and geology and learned a lot and decided I'm hard-headed enough that my daughters would never know more about dinosaurs than, than their mother. So that just built me up. And then we were in an area that had a great natural history museum that allowed volunteering. And so I started volunteering in the natural history museum and um, got into their fossil prep lab and that was it. Um, and when we moved to Ithaca, I found out that we had this amazing small um, but very hands-on um, place that I could also volunteer. And so I started volunteering in their education department and in their prep lab and they eventually couldn't get rid of me and they hired me and so I have moved myself into the prep lab and now I supervise it and um, manage all of the education in, in the museum so it keeps me busy um, but fun so that was probably the shortest story of that I've ever told <laughs> thank you <laughs> so it doesn't mean that um, you know, it's funny because when, when the girls were little, we were talking about this, this dinosaur knowledge. So, you know, a six-year-old probably has the spike of dinosaur interest and knowledge, and some of them never get rid of it, but most of them will, will go, and then, you know, the world opens up to them, and so their knowledge and interest in dinosaurs go down. And then, um, and then it goes back up again when you have kids because, like me, you start reading about them, and it's cool, and you have to know what you know how to say diplodocus and you know know what how big a t-rex is and where they're you know the whole bit so all of a sudden your knowledge of dinosaurs goes back up so you have the second spike and um i just never went back down but most people will end up going down so in a normal life you probably have had several spikes of dinosaurs and depending on what you know where your interest goes um will you know we all know about the curves now um and um, your life can change as you as you learn about, about dinosaurs. And it is a constantly changing field. There isn't a week that goes by that either something new happened in paleontology surrounding the dinosaurs, a new finding, a new animal, a new information about um, dinosaurs. And so it is, even though they only exist as, as birds today, um, it is a it is a very 
very active field um, of science. Speaking of uh, new discoveries, we have a question. Um, is it true that we don't know what dinosaurs actually look like? So, yes and no, um, because we're putting dinosaurs in a big category. Um, we, in any time we're looking at fossils, we have to assume certain things. And um, there's a term in geology called uniformitarianism, which is like one of my favorite words. Um, and it means that um, there, that we need to, we, we can assume that the way rocks were made and the way animals lived and moved around and ate and grew um, and, you know, the earth moves is the same today as it was long ago. So as a, um, as a, like a, a paleo artist, you need to know what a dinosaur, what a, what a live animal looks like out of their skeleton. And so, yes, we've never seen a real live non-bird dinosaur, non-avian dinosaur, but we have avian dinosaurs. We have um, been able to um, study and, and create these animals. And they're always going to be tweaking. They're always going to be changing. Um, and so there are some dinosaurs that we might only have one, one, one bone connected to it. And so that assumption of what that looks like will change. We, of course, didn't know about feathers on dinosaurs back um, back in the 80s um, before they started finding more and more of them. Um, so yes, we are probably, unless we have a time machine, we'll never be able to know that all the dinosaurs we've created look the same and look correct. But I think we have gotten very close um, because of the amazing um, connection between art and science and um, the embolic, like I've worked with a lot of artists who recreate dinosaurs and they don't just say, here's a bone, this is what it should look like. They study, they dissect animals, they figure out what, you know, where this muscle goes and then what the skin looks like over it. So it is an amazing um, field because it's not just the paleontologist who can tell you a little bit about that animal, it's a combination of many knowledgeable people that can be put together. So, yes, we probably won't ever know if we are absolutely true unless we get, you know, the time machine. But I think we are we we get closer every every time we get new discoveries. It's a good question. Right. So cool! Thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Very interesting. Um, I want to thank you and thank everybody who attended. Uh, feel free if you have any feedback, you can send us an email at communityengagement at pmlib.org. And I hope everyone has a good evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Bickley.